most eeriest experiences because they shut down New York. So the only vehicles allowed were military vehicles and police. Mm. So I went out that night to meet someone for dinner, a friend of mine, you may know him, Jim White, he used to be the chairman of William Morris. Mm -hmm. And you're walking down the streets of New York and there's no one out and there's no traffic and all you hear are sirens and you see an occasional car and, and the helicopters uh, overhead, those big you know, black hawks, because yeah. yeah. they don't, va boom, va boom, va boom. Well, we had those here at, from, because of the Pentagon and you could hear yeah. every night in our, over our house. It was awful. It was nice when that was done. Yeah, but I, I, was right. in, I was in the Army. I was in Fort Belvoir. I really like this part of the country. Oh, you were? Yeah. And I'm, the ch company I'm chairman of is based in Baltimore. Oh. Yeah. You're going to become a D.C. person. I don't think so. It's the second one today who said that. <laughs> All right. Ready? Yes, ma'am. You good? Yeah. Okay. So let's just start by talking about how did you come to know Bob Correa? Well, let me... Let me start with an anecdote that, that uh, occurs to me. It really just happened. And in a way, it summarizes who Bob Correo is. My eight-year-old granddaughter, Danielle Ruth Carol Brennan, received her first communion last week. We went back to Boston. And the priest says to her, now it's time for your confession. What have you done wrong? And Danielle says to the priest, Father Joe, well, I haven't done anything wrong. He says, oh, you must have done something wrong. Like, did you snap at your sister? Were you mean in school? I wasn't mean in school. I don't snap at my sisters. I love them. I don't lie to my mommy and daddy. So finally, after three or four questions, she finally says, Father Joe, I'm a very good girl. And he gave her three Hail Marys because he got frustrated with her. Well, that's sort of Bob Correo. What have you ever done wrong, Bob? I mean, maybe his wife Peggy has seen some of that. But Bob is pretty much so what I'm you see. Right there, what is that? Uh, phone? Yeah, that was my phone. Oh. I thought I turned it off. Okay. Let me just turn the power off. Okay. I'll put it back Can you set it up there? Yes, I turned the power off. Okay. So where were you? Let me so, start again. So basically, so you said nothing. Sorry, his wife. One, one right. Is he on? Uh, okay. Mike's rubbing against the jacket. He just really likes. Why don't I just start again? Right, because you, okay. then there's, a, there's a build that we lose the momentum. All righty. You good now? Yeah. You good? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So. Instead of starting Talking. this discovery of Bob Correo with a question, let me start it with an anecdote. And it relates to my eight-year-old granddaughter, Danielle Ruth Carol Brennan, who received her first communion last week in Boston. When the priest called her in and said, Danielle, it's now time to confess, Danielle said, I haven't done anything wrong. So the priest said, well, Danielle, have you ever been mean to your sisters? No, I love my sisters, and she has three. Danielle, have you ever lied to mommy and daddy? No, I don't lie to mommy and daddy. Danielle, has there ever been anything in school where you were mean to someone? I'm not mean to someone, Father. I am a good girl. So Father Joe gave her three Hail Marys in frustration, and off she went. And that's sort of what Bob Correo is. I've never seen the guy do anything wrong. Now, maybe Peggy would disagree with that. But the key to Bob is that what you see is what you get. A guy whose heart is as big as the Atlantic Ocean, whose energy is as positive as a nuclear reactor, and whose ability to get involved at a level that is unknown to most people is absolutely legendary. So Bob, let me now say congratulations on this award and let me see if we can get in some more of the aberrant stories and aspects of your personality, as good as you are. <laughs> that was perfect. But I'm still going to ask you a couple questions. No, no, okay, okay. good. That was lovely. Um, but how did you get to know him? Where did you meet him along the way? I was overseeing a marketing budget of about $10 billion at General Motors, and Bob wanted to see me. It's not really easy to get in to see me. You have to go past a couple of gatekeepers 
and the kind of things that Bob was involved, was involved with were really not on my agenda. But somehow, Bob got in to see me. And he charmed me with his enthusiasm, his ideas, and the fact that he's a born winner. I mean, his career is really a record of doing things that people thought couldn't be done or doing things that had never been done before. And I've learned very little in business, actually, in over 40 years. One of the things I've learned is you bet on good people. So Bob came in to see me, he explained what he was doing, and made a bet, and that started our relationship. What was he doing? Well, he was running his magazine business and program business at the time. And for a company like General Motors, with the kind of budgets we had, that was way at the bottom of the list in terms of anything. We were looking at this at Super Bowls. Uh, but Bob convinced me that there was an elegance to the audience for those magazines, and there was a level of engagement and, and involvement that would work for an advertiser. Uh, and Bob sold on a very personal level but he never let facts get in the way of his personal relationship. So the combination of Bob's perseverance, his understanding of his product, uh, and the facts created a situation where we became an advertiser. And out of that, we created a relationship. So how would you, well, you've really already described him, so I don't think we need to do that again, because I think it was good. Um, he is generous. He's a generous guy, and, and he's a, and he's a, but he's also a really unpretentious, nice guy. Unless you talk about Notre Dame, um, yeah. how would you describe him? Well, yeah, when you say Bob is generous, the most important aspect of his generosity is his generosity of soul. I mean, I said before that what you see is what you get. So his willingness to reach out, to help, is not manufactured. That's not. An act, and believe me, I've seen a lot of people in 45 years in business who work at being like that, and it becomes detectable, but that's not really the case with Bob. So I guess how, you ask yourself, how did he get that way? It's there. You can't fake it, you can't practice it, you can't go to school for it. It's either there or not. Bob is, in every sense of the word, a good man. That's great. That's a great line, right? That's a Do you. Um so you were honored by the Sons of Italy, what? 98. 14 years ago. Oh, Hard to believe, do I look the same? You look Hey, fabulous. Bobby is my hair. Bob sent me a, a photo the other day of, of Peggy and I at that event, and his caption was, we were young once. So I sent it back to him, and I said, speak for yourself. <laughs> oh, Peggy good. hasn't changed. I will admit I've added her a little gray in a couple of lines. Gray's good. Gray's good on a man. Um, so do you think it's appropriate that the Sons of Italy would be honoring him? Uh, yes. I, I, here's how I felt about the Sons of Italy. And I've been involved in a lot of charitable endeavors. I've chaired events. I've raised money. I've been honored. And the essence of the Sons of Italy, in my view, has been the commitment that are involved, of the people involved with the organization. It's not a fly-by-night kind of thing. It's not trenchant. It's a deeply held belief that what they're doing in terms of educational funding is important and has an impact on the lives of individuals. And I'm, from a, from a pro bono standpoint, I am much more, I look much more favorably at helping people one at a time than sort of massive applications of money or efforts. So to me, the key to the, the NILA is this effort to deal with students one at a time. It personalizes it. There's an opportunity for contributors to actually see the, their, their money working. There's a, a storyline that continues after the award itself. It's not uh, a one-shot, and it's not a hookup. And from that standpoint, this organization is very different. Do you think that's why Bob got involved with them? Because he really did jump in and make a difference here, how the dinner was. I think the first year, the year you were honored. Um, well, I think that Bob, he has a lot of close friends in the Italian-American community. And I think that, and he spends a lot of time in Italy. And you know, one, one thing you have to say about the Italians is that we feel things. and 
somewhere along the line, Bob met one of these young scholarship recipients. I'm not sure exactly when or who it was, but in, in, in recalling my conversation with him, the impact on that one person of this effort is what triggered Bob's interest to in that. And then, of course, John Mariani probably forced him into it. Probably. All right, you said lots of awesome stuff that we can use in the video. Now I want you to give us something that we can't use in the video that only goes to Bob. Well, uh, yeah, as I said, Bob, you know, they want me to give something to you that can't be used in a video, but I started by saying, like, you're really a good person, so how much can there be? But one anecdote, and I tell this to a lot of people, particularly when I'm in an Italian restaurant, is the first time we visited you in mid-ocean, we came down on a, a private plane from a company's board I was on, uh, and as soon as we got to the house, Bob went outside clipped some zucchini buds off his plants, came in, opened them up, put ricotta cheese inside, put them in his frying pan, and fried up the best stuffed zucchini I have ever had in my life. That is a fact that you can take to the grave, because I do know food and I know Italian food. The other anecdote is that you're the only person I've ever known in my life who acknowledged my golfing prowess on the 18th hole at Mid-Ocean, which I claim to actually own. You don't think he has an unhealthy love for Notre Dame? I, I think that, what you have to, I, know have a lot of, I know a lot of Notre Dame grads, and what you really need to understand about Notre Dame grads is that uh, they've been uh, signed by someone to behave the way they do and you just have to excuse it as part of normal behavior. All right, you're awesome. Thank you very okay. much. <clears throat> anyway, I think it's